Do you trust me? <laughs> Have you ever wondered why God put the tree in the center of the garden if he didn't want Adam and Eve to eat of it? It seems a little cruel, I think we might say. It's kind of like, okay, Jimmy, you can play with all of the Tonka trucks, except for this one. And I'm just going to put it right here in the middle of the room, but don't touch it. You can play with all of the Tonka trucks, just not that one. Good luck, Jimmy. All right. Uh, and maybe that's how we feel on uh, Fridays in Lent or throughout Lent when we're staring down that thing that we promised to give up and we're just like, man, I really don't want to have to have chick uh, fish filet again. I'd much rather prefer to have Chick-fil-A instead. But let me ask you this, and it's not a trick question. Who tempted Adam and Eve in the garden? Serpent. Satan, right? The serpent, the devil. Who tempted Jesus in the desert? Satan. Satan, the serpent, the devil. So who then do you think tempts us? Satan, the serpent, the devil. Exactly. God does not tempt us. Satan does. And he's been using the same trick literally since the very beginning. And it's simply this. He tries to get us to not trust God. At the heart of all sin, it is the temptation to not trust God. Unfortunately, although we, the baptized, are children of God, we are also children of Adam and Eve. And since Adam and Eve chose to submit themselves to the suggestions of Satan rather than God, all of us bear that same wound of distrust. And we all have experienced that. I know I should pray more. I know I should quit that habit. I know that I should be reading the Bible more, but we don't. Why? Because let me suggest that deep down, we all wonder, will I really be more happy if I spend more time in prayer? Will I really be satisfied if I give up this thing that I know I'm not supposed to be doing? Will I really be satisfied if I spend t more time reading scripture rather than watching TV? abundantly clear that if you know what's best for me, you have what is best for me, what will make me happy, just make it clearer so that I'll do it, then I'll do it, then I'll follow it. And he's just like, I have. I gave you the book. I gave you my church. I gave you the sacraments. I gave you my body and my blood. But I won't force you. I won't force you. Because love needs to be free. I won't force you to fast. I won't force you to pray. I won't force you to come to Mass. Because I love you. And I want you to make that choice. The two trees in Genesis are prototypical of this choice, of these two options 
that we all have. And it's the same dichotomy that we actually see all throughout Scripture. If you remember from two weeks ago, we heard it very clearly in Deuteronomy 30 and Sirach 15, which say the same thing. Today I have set before you life and death, water and fire, good and evil. Choose life then. If we obey God and trust that what he asks of us, what he commands us, will actually make us happy, that it is actually what is best for us, then we are in effect choosing life. We are choosing the tree of life. Because remember that God never said that he wouldn't give Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life. He only said to trust him. To trust that where he was guiding them, that he was guiding them to life and guiding them away from death away from what would hurt them. And remember that to know in Scripture often means to become intimately acquainted with, intimately united with. Adam knew his wife Eve, and they conceived and bore a son. You don't do that just by, like, shaking hands and, you know, getting to meet the person, right? No, to know is to have this intimate union with. And it's a beautiful image for the marital act, to know completely and vulnerably the other. Adam and Eve were thus already intimately knowing, intimately uniting, knighted with good, with God in the garden. And so they were ultimate, they were already, they, are all, they already knew goodness. But when they disregarded God's guidance and ate of the forbidden tree, then they truly came to know both good and evil. That's why it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They became intimately united with the distrust that was sown by the enemy whereas before they had only known good. And what does God say that this choice will lead to? It leads to death. Not just physically, but spiritually as well. Because why? Well, if God is the source of life, if God is the source of our existence, of all that we have and all that we are, then to separate oneself from that is to separate oneself from life, which is simply what we call death. God did not make death, as it says in Wisdom 113, rather, as we just heard from Romans, through one man sin enter the world, and through sin, death. God makes life. And isn't that what we experience now? that when we encounter sin in the world, that it hurts the life within us. And just as Adam and Eve knew both good and evil, so too all of us have been intimately acquainted with both good and evil in our lives. Because we live in a post-Eden world. But why then, we might ask, would God immediately prevent Adam and Eve from taking from the tree of life? If they had just been spiritually dead, or they're dying and physically dying, why would God keep them from the tree of life? Wouldn't it make sense that he would give them life where they were experiencing death? And he says, Now lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. And we're like, what? If they chose death, why not give them life instead? Well, the short answer, and you might find this surprising, is because that would be even worse. Think about it. 
if Adam and Eve were spiritually dead, and then they ate the fruit that would give them eternal life, that would make them live forever, then they would be stuck in an eternity of spiritual death, an eternity of separation from God. And what is that? God does not want an eternity of life separated from him. God does not want us to have an eternity of spiritual death. No, my friends, we have to trust always that God always wants what's best for us, that God always knows what is best for us, and that that is where he's leading us. He's not holding anything back from us. God wants to give us from the fruit of the tree of life, but he needed to reconcile us to himself first to make us spiritually alive, to give us again the breath of his spirit before making us live forever. And that's a beautiful thing because he has already given us the fruit of the tree of life. He took our sinful nature to the wood of the cross and there he turns death into life. He gives us in his flesh and blood hanging on the tree of the cross, now the fruit of the tree of life, the Eucharist. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have eternal life. Now, what's fascinating and what um, I was really blown away by while I was meditating on this passage this week is to see that um, this actually really helps to make clear a teaching that I've always struggled to and found very difficult to explain. And uh, I hope you can trust me on this as well. Um, because you see the same principles that we just saw with the tree of life in the Garden of Eden also apply to the tree of life on Calvary. Namely, that there is a reason, a beautiful, loving reason, why God wants us to be reconciled with him first in baptism and in confession before we receive communion, before we receive the Eucharist, before we become one flesh with him in eating of the fruit of the tree of life. And it is simply because communion is meant to be a sealing, a consummation of our already existing communion with God. Communion is a furthering of our current communion with God. And so if we're not in communion with God or not in communion with his church, his body, his bride, he wants to reconcile us to himself. He wants to forgive us, and he has already paid the price to make that happen. But just like with everything else, he leaves us radically free to either receive his forgiveness and confession or not. But as 1 John 1 tells us, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It can certainly be hard to see that not everyone at not every Mass is in a proper place to be able to receive communion that day because we know how amazing the Eucharist is. It is Jesus himself. It is a taste of heaven. We are made for union with God, and that is what we receive in communion. But we can also think of it this way, in addition to that analogy between the fruit of the tree of life and Eden. And I'm sorry if this is a painful analogy for some of us, 
um, but it's actually very fitting because it's very biblical. All you have to do is just read the book of Hosea and you'll know why. Imagine a spouse, God forbid, who is discovered to be unfaithful in a serious way. And then, despite their spouse knowing that they were cheating on them, they then presume to just enter into the marital act without first even apologizing. Unthinkable. Right? How insulting and how indignifying is that? It's like saying, you're not even worth me saying sorry to. How much more so with our infinitely good God? There are, in fact, many ways, many reasons why um, we would come to Mass and not receive communion. And so as a result of that, we should never judge anybody when they come up and they have their arms crossed, or they're not receiving that day, we should never judge anybody because there's plenty of good reasons why they might not be receiving that day. Perhaps they forgot about the Eucharistic fast. Maybe they were doing something else. They were fasting, they were feeling lightheaded, so they had to take something to eat before they came within an hour of receiving, and so they're not going to receive that day. Or maybe they just feel like they're super distracted at Mass, uh, and so like mentally, spiritually, they don't feel prepared to be able to become one flesh with God at that moment. Okay. Or maybe this is like their second mass that day and they've literally already received because they've been lecturing or working the cameras or serving or whatever. But even if we couldn't make confession before Sunday mass because when we needed to, better that we focus on our relationship with God than what other people might think of us. Isn't that what matters more? St. Paul put it this way uh, in 1 Corinthians 11. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many among you are ill and infirm and a considerable number are dying. Dying. <laughs> Can you believe that St. Paul wrote that? But it's because it's true. It's scripture. If we're not in a state of grace and not in that place to be able to receive our Lord in communion that day, that's okay, the Lord wants to forgive us. But if we presume to enter into that one flesh union without first asking for forgiveness, we are adding sin to sin. And we are committing further serious sin. And the Lord does not want that for us. God always wants what's best for us. It's just like we heard about with the two trees. We must be reconciled before we can eat of the tree of life because God wants what's best for us. And that's why the church, too, actually requires us, and you might not have known this, um, which is why it's important to share this. Uh, the church says that we must confess our serious sins at least once a year. Must. It's not an option. I was pretty blown away when I read that in Catechism 2242, 2042. And yes, none of us is worthy to receive communion. But would that we more fervently believed that? That none of us is ever worthy to receive our Lord. None of us can do anything to ever deserve or ever earn to be united with God himself in that way. It is only a gift that he can give to us. And so all the more reason then that we should do our very best to prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls 
to receive him? Do we trust that Jesus gave us confession because it is what is good for us? As we just heard today, Jesus will go into the most deserted, the most painful, the most troubled places of our hearts, and he will whoop the devil on our behalf. He's not afraid of our sin. We just have to give it to him because he leaves us radically free because of love. Here in God's church, we are given everything we need for new life, a washing, clean, consistent teaching, forgiveness of sins, and yes, even the fruit of the tree of life. Do you trust me, our Lord says. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you.